Hello, Berlin. Um, so I <coughs> want to say um, thanks for SuperVenture for having us. Our panel is called Innovations in VC, Time to Think Outside the Box. Uh, my name's Michael, um, quick intro partner at Cottonwood Ventures. So it's an early stage deep tech fund, uh, top decile performer. Uh, my colleague Alan is over there in the corner. If any LPs want to talk to, uh, to Alan about uh, deep tech funding, there he is. Another hat I wear is I'm also a partner at uh, Multiple Capital, so we invest in early stage VC funds in Europe. Uh, Ayrton from Frankfurt is here somewhere, so you can reach out to him. Um, want to say thanks for all the panelists for joining us. Uh, everybody's kind of fresh in from London, um, Brexit be damned. Um, so everybody, so Sitar, Matt, Carmen, Gabby, uh, take a moment to introduce yourselves and tell us what you guys do. Oh, me? Yeah, yeah start at the end there. Uh, hi, I'm Gabby. I'm a partner at Active Ventures. We invest in early stage tech companies that are transforming the built world, seed to Series A across Europe. Hi, I'm Carmen. Um, I'm launching a fund called Cocoa. And basically, we're VC student angels. So the idea is that we invest angel checks. We optimize for access and are independent and neutral. But we have been VCs, so we bring on the ex VC expertise and network. Uh, hi, everyone. I'm Matt. Uh, along with my more famous co-founder, I founded Ada Ventures. <laughs> We're a pre-seed stage fund in the UK, investing in overlooked founders and markets. Hi, I'm Sidhar from Connect Ventures, uh, based in London, seed stage fund. We invest in uh, seed companies across Europe that are focused on product. Thank you. So um, a bit about today's format. So we're going to start with a speed round. So uh, questions that require one or two word answers just to get the ball rolling because it's after lunch. Everybody's a bit sleepy. Uh, we want to kind of pick up the pace a bit. So I posted this question on social media, um, got a few hundred responses. We we're definitely not going to ask a few hundred questions because that would just be overkill, but filtered out about 20 or 30, which could be relevant. Um, and also taking some live questions in from social media as well to keep things a bit edgy. Uh, the so, post edgy. <laughs> so edgy. So <laughs> edgy. You never know what's going to happen, with, especially the normies on LinkedIn. They're going to come with some really strange questions. So um, again, don't overthink it. It should be pretty easy for some VCs not to overthink it. Um, you guys ready? Ready? Let's go for no, it. No, are you guys ready? <laughs> Come on, let's go and kick it up. Come on, yeah. <laughs> All right, so do VCs actually need to think outside the box? Yes. <laughs> go down the line. Yes. Of course. Yes. Yes. Um, is I mean, the... it's literally the job, isn't it? Yeah, exactly. Okay. So uh, is the future of VC tokenized? No. Uh, in 10 years' time, will the UK still be Europe's largest venture ecosystem? Already isn't. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, which European country's startup scene will grow the most over the next 10 years? You've had Romania produce UiPath, you've had five or six unicorns come out of Portugal. Where's the growth in the future of European VC going to be? Portugal. Portugal. Yeah. Where? Moldova. Moldova. <laughs> Colette, a very famous Moldovan. <laughs> Anybody? Uh, so in 10 years' time, which country will have the EU's largest ecosystem? Also another question that kept popping up. You could go rogue and say the UK will be I would still in. say UK. Yeah. Back in the EU. Yeah. Um, nobody for Germany. We're in Germany. Nobody's voting for Germany. Nobody's voting for France. France has, definitely has a shot. Yeah, I would say France has okay. a shot. Um, will US VCs dominate European venture? That one is coming in from LinkedIn. Also self-serving, <laughs> no. <laughs> I think they're making a pretty good go of it right yeah. now. Yeah. yeah. Which company will be Europe's next 100 billion euro tech company? Habu Technologies, based in Bristol. <laughs> <laughs> Disclosure, a definitely company? a shareholder. <laughs> um, ESG, the future of investing, or just feel-good marketing? Cool. Table stakes. Yes. Table stakes. Table stakes. 
how is, so how is ESG, I mean, are you guys getting a lot of pushback from LPs on ESG? Do you think that's going to be the future of reporting? Because this is about the future and innovation is, is. So again, are we getting pushback from LPs? Yeah, I mean, are your LPs coming in and saying, because we have a room, one of the main points of this room is to have LPs in the room. So are LPs now coming in, particularly on the government side, as we know that's quite prevalent in Europe, are they coming in saying, hey, this is what we want? Because we've talked about, mm -hmm. I think the BVCA was talking also about having some recommendations on how that would go. And obviously, private equity firms are now hiring I think it's, it's ESG teams. Just a couple so far. But I think in order for it to become table stakes, it will almost certainly have to come from the LPs. Yeah. Yep. Mm. Uh, climate tech, trillion dollar opportunity or clean tech 2.0? Trillion dollar opportunity. OK. Uh, Lisbon or Barcelona? Lisbon. Barcelona. <laughs> Barcelona. <laughs> Barcelona. Barcelona. Is this for yeah. holiday? Yeah. Or yeah. Right, at least. Yeah, exactly. like, where, where do you want to go? If you, could, if you were going to do remote work, I think it was more like a question around that. Barcelona. Yeah. Lisbon, because they don't tax on crypto. Lisbon, yeah. Yeah, well, tax. They don't want the tax on crypto. <laughs> There's no tax on crypto. Yeah. yeah. No. I got yeah. Lisbon. Tax is interesting. It's so also why it's the largest growth. Yeah, exactly. Country, for sure. So we've got three to one Lisbon over Barcelona, except the one vote coming from. The Spaniard. I'll, I'll go to the I'm from side. Madrid, though. So. Oh, yeah, yeah. Quite controversial there. Um, here's two coming in from LinkedIn that are Germany specific. Will Germany ever fix its ESOP regulations? <laughs> no. <laughs> well, I have no idea. if you think about how long it takes to close a deal in Germany, yeah, no. it's not looking great. Right. So, I mean, do you think that how many of the four have you done deals in Germany? Okay. So how would you describe your experience of doing deals in Germany? Painful. Worse than Spain. Holy that shit. is already like, <laughs> no, that is already like Holy something. Because I've also done deals in Spain, and Spain is yeah, it's no. not as bad as Italy, but it's. <laughs> Germany is. Germany is quite painful. I mean, getting the fax requests and, yeah. Fax. Did yeah, I've got, I, got, yeah, I remember having a notary asking me, one of the German notaries asked me like for my fax number. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Which is fun. So here's the follow-up question to that. Uh, are German notaries the worst? Are German notaries <laughs> the worst? Uh, my vote would be for Italian notaries, in my no, experience. No, no, no. I think they probably are. Because if no. you think about like Spanish or Italian notaries, they're bad. But they are. They know how to be cheeky. You know, like you can yeah, of course. Yeah, find Latin, like the shortcut. Right? There's, a, Germany it's, is like, there's more corruption, is what you're saying, in Spain <laughs> than Italy. OK, fine. Let me just say that. There are ways to get to where you want to get. Notaries are just Notaries the worst. Are the worst. I mean, I think, I think the, the whole worst. common law concept it's, of notaries sorry, is but like Ger antiquated. But Germans are also like so to the script, you know. Yeah. You mean honest and following yeah. the law. Yeah, as they should. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so depends on what you want to achieve. Leave it there. Um, should VCs have startup experience? Yes. I think it doesn't bring empathy, but it doesn't show you're a better. It does, it's not proven. It makes you a better investor. I think no, there's, there's, yeah. yeah, I think that's something that's. I mean, you know, Fred Wilson's a career VC. You've had famous journalists and lawyers. It, and experience but, versus founder. Startup experience. Mm. It's operational experience, maybe. But, yeah. Mm. Um, brighter future: startup studios or accelerators? Sorry, what? Brighter future, startup studios or accelerators? Startup studios? Well, what, what, what do you mean? Startup, it, it, studios? startup studios, so like the ones like, so e-founders in Paris, which are creating companies and then taking equity. Ah, incubators, like. Yeah. So what's the question? Sorry. <laughs> which one is a brighter future? Startup well, accelerator or startup future? studio? Because startup studios are kind of all the rage now and everybody's trying to create them and a lot of the LPs are getting pitched on the startup studio model. Um, it kind of goes back to the rocket model of, you know. I think none. <laughs> That's a damn good answer. I agree. I, yeah, I mean, if you look at their terms, basically, right? I don't know. I think. Yeah. It should so, to be, I mean, E Founders has had exceptional returns. Yeah, yeah, of course, yeah, yeah, and and also, if, and I mean, now that I don't know E Founders well, but if you look at the, how much stake they take, they probably like yeah. the problem is it may, they make it generally, and I'm generalizing, uh, not, not not any specific model, but they make it very hard for then ask to fund mm. that company when you find a huge stakeholder there. So yes, one might work and will return, yeah. But so, I think with the startup studio model, it's kind of like from the deep tech side, right? So there's always the complaint that universities take too much yeah, equity. Exactly. Um, the startup studio model is quite similar. So how much is too much equity for either an accelerator, a, a, an incubator, a university to take? Probably less than 7%. Less than 7%. Less than 7, 10%. Okay. Yeah. Is, is what they should do. Should do. Yeah. Okay. 
because Oxford just came out and said they'll take 10% for doing absolutely nothing. Well, they used to take 30, no? Yeah, like, it's 20%, so it's 20 and 10. Yeah, yeah like. um, Will everyone eventually end up a partner at Andrews and Horowitz? <laughs> <laughs> but that's that came so in via Twitter. <laughs> yes, no. No, no. no. Uh, would most LPs make good direct investors? Because that's a big trend amongst no. LPs. No. We'll let them out. <laughs> uh, is an MBA a good degree for a VC to have? Maybe. Corporate VC is good or bad? Thanks. Getting better. Getting better. Fair. Uh, here's an interesting one. So are scouts just VCs outsourcing their junior VC roles? <laughs> <laughs> it's me mechanical Turk for sourcing. <laughs> right. So I think, speaking as a VC who has a scout network, yeah, how sure. do you view it? Um, ours is slightly different in that it's more about, it's a very long-term view on widening access to being a VC. Yeah. So we have 95 scouts now. Um, and they all represent communities that are typically underrepresented within early stage and tech. So that's a, that's a great benefit for those communities to have their leader be a scout at ADA. Um, we have a you know, good deal with them and it's good for us, et cetera, but there's a, there's a huge ecosystem play that we're doing that at scale, right? So it's not just about, oh, I know a few people who have got great deal flow. I'll, bring, I'll enfranchise them into my club and give them a kickback if they throw me a deal that I do. So I think scouts, is def that, this is about innovation, right? I think yep. scout networks is, a, is an area for massive innovation. Yep. We have one view on it, which is in the longer term, if VC is being disrupted, more people are getting into it, and we've got more, more sources of interesting deal flow, mm -hmm. the pie at the end is gonna be better for everybody. But what do you say to those scouts? If you have 95 scouts, the odds that one of those scouts is actually gonna get one of their deals done is quite small, so what's? Well, five out of 23 portfolio companies at Ada today are scout sourced. Okay. So it's, it's definitely worth it. That's atypical though. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I accept that. I, yeah. I would also say that you guys, because of your focus on them, the represented communities have a different approach. If you think about the likes of like Sequoia or Axel having scouts, like mm -hmm. I, I, I don't even think it's so much about source. They have insane sourcing machines, right? It's almost about like, getting access into companies that from the main model, main fund, it wouldn't make sense for them to invest that sort of ticket and positioning, like almost buying options at the table for the future rather than the sourcing itself, mm. which like, I mean, the war almost feels right now and it's more about winning mm. <laughs> than about seeing the deals, right? And um, so I think the scouts play a big role and the more senior they get, the more it is about winning or getting into a deal than actually them bringing you a lot of deal flow that you wouldn't have seen otherwise. Mm. But I also think for not probably Sequoia and Excel, for a lot of other funds, it's also a way to not outsource the junior investment team, but actually, so, so we don't, we're a partner only fund. We don't have any junior people. And I think it's getting harder and harder to have a fund that has people at the associate and principal level for any given amount of time because it's actually quite easy. It's a lot easier now to leave and just start your own fund, mm -hmm. even if it's a micro GP fund. And so it's very hard to convince someone to, you know, stay for like five, seven years in this like model where you then get trained up to be a partner. And I think one one path for for a lot of venture funds is to have the scout network where you're effectively working with people that are potentially your future partners, but without with them having flexibility in what they do, and you having flexibility in, in how you work with them. And you don't have that, so you don't you don't have the commitment. But it actually maybe works better now uh, than convincing someone to be an associate and sit through two fund cycles, mm. you know, before they can do anything interesting. So do you see, do you foresee five years from now, say, the kind of end of the junior role at a VC firm? Yeah, we'll all, we'll all be at, what was it? Andreessen. Andreessen, Andreessen. Yeah, we'll all be at Andreessen, that's fine, it's done. <laughs> because that is, I mean, it's something you're, you're definitely seeing, where you have kind of people going out in scouts, and they put themselves as scouts, and they sort of a solo GP fund, and they go from solo GP funds, and now the best solo GPs are being picked up. Um, well, that's also going to, I mean, I think you, you know as well, I don't know if it's public knowledge, but there will be an open source I scouting do. platform coming soon, yes. uh, which will certainly smash to pieces a lot of stuff that's going on. Right. And, and will give those individuals the opportunity to kind of become superstars or influencers in their own right with their own you know, deal flow, their own thesis, etc. 
And, th and I think that goes back to, because one of the points was saying, so if you've got 95 scouts and you've got five that have had deals, that's still 90 that haven't gotten a deal done. But if you're on a platform where you can scout for 20, 30, 40 firms, I think your incentive goes mm. up. So is that the future of scouting? I mean, from what I've seen, highly likely. Mm. Yeah, definitely. If they get it right, if they get it right, which it looks like they've got a good shot of getting it right, given the people they're speaking to. Yeah. I just don't know if it, I'm not trying to be awkward. I just don't know if it's public information. <laughs> but you asked about whether in the future no venture funds have any junior investment team. I actually think venture funds will change generally quite substantially in that you, venture funds right now are sort of, they're full stack. You do everything, right? You do the sourcing and you do the, the finance compliance, et cetera. And what we're seeing is like, just like with, with the startups we back, you sort of focus on what your unique value add is or what your unique solution is, and then everything else is provided by another company. Is this a, low code, no code VC? Pretty much, right? So, so, so it's like the, the compliance uh, used to be internal, it's now obviously a lot of services firms, it's now actually, I think, including gonna be software. So we're looking at, at actually a lot of our fund management now going onto a, like a software stack. Sourcing, I think, is, is kind of the same thing, right? If you're relying on sourcing, uh, if you're relying on your junior investment team for sourcing, you actually have a rate limiter there. And so actually removing it from your junior investment team and using, again, software probably instead, or this you know, scouting platform significantly increases. So I think venture and and then at the end we'll be like, well, what does a VC actually do? And the GPs will actually have to answer the question, what is our value add, finally? Finally. Which they you know, haven't really had to do. After 75 after so years from yeah, George exactly. Stewart founding it. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I think what Sita is saying is right on point. And when you think about why VC needs to think outside the box. Like, this market moves so fast that you need, in my view, like two things to like sort of win it. It's one is imagination, but two is flexibility, right? You need flexibility built in to play this imagination. And we're in this moment where like funds are getting larger and larger, and you have this whole structure of like 20, 30 people, 50. How, do you, how are you flexible with that, right? As opposed to if you really like outsource everything that is not your superpower, and you're like, okay, this is what I'm left with. Yep. You're so much more agile to play this market that moves faster than we can even like sort of yep. uh, process. Well, right? then what about some of the mega funds now you're seeing like Tiger coming in, they're being super flexible, right? And that was on the previous panel, but they've got massive teams, yeah. but they've kind of built a model that's light, you know? Yeah, and that's like decision making is very... Dec yeah, <laughs> yeah, we'll see, fast. right? And yeah. that's the thing, like, they, have, they have Bain on their payroll, they've got... Um, and they've, they've outsourced a lot of the process, but they've also been doing it for, you go back to kind of the, the origins of Tiger, it's very much of the hedge fund financial model. Um, so one of the questions is, going kind of picking up on the Tiger point, is are the crossover funds um, scary to early stage VCs? Are they scary? Scary. Are they, you know, are they keeping up at night? Are you thinking it's the future, it's a good future, it's a bad future, it's... The crossover funds, because they've, they've, they've been crossover funds before. I mean, in the last, in the dot-com boom, I mean, a lot of the PE firms and hedge funds also jumped over. I look, I look at it as exciting in that there's a, there's a degree of disruption and sophistication coming to our capital market, mm. which we haven't had for so long. For so long, it's just been this 10 plus 2, you're locked in, you're never going to make any money for 10 years unless you're any good, you know. And I think that all, that all of those things, all those features that are coming through the market, like earlier secondary liquidity for founders, taking that financial pressure, these things are, fee are indicative of a capital market that's becoming more sophisticated and growing up. And that's really driven by the massive predominance of technology that's suddenly become you know, everywhere we are, which we've all been waiting for for a long time. To serve that, we need a heck of a lot more capital than we currently have in venture capital as a whole even. So I, I think it's exciting. I think it's exciting. I mean, I don't think it's scary. I think it's going to make everybody step up their game because if it is about like fast and cheap capital, definitely they like, it's very hard to compete with them. But then likewise, I think for Europe specifically, it's also providing capital that allows to generate outcomes that like two years ago or three years ago we didn't even think were like sort of possible. I'll share something um, that I heard. It, it, they didn't tell it directly to me, so caveat, but so we know what we're up against when you say, are they scary? Um, let's say Tiger or Cote, um, is their, they have their partners and their partners make their own private investments. So these guys have hired financial managers to manage their private investments because it is between four and five hours a week. And so his argument of the one of those partners was like, yeah, because I mean, five hours a week, that's like two deals. 
two or three years, right? And, and so that's how they think, right? So that's like what we are, about. <laughs> it's just like two to three deals, five hours a week. And so you who are starting a new fund, are you deliberately staying small? Because yes. again, you have the kind of the barbelling of venture capital, which either you go really, really early or really late, and nobody wants to be kind of the, in the middle space anymore. So that goes back to my point of finding your superpowers, right? We're doing a lot of things that are very different. So in a world where everybody's going larger, we're like, we believe in the power of small. We optimize for access, not stake. Our model is based on collaborating with other funds, not competing. And we prioritize EQ over IQ. So we're doing like a lot of different things. But it goes back to your to your um, point, of, like finding your superpowers, right? Do a tiger scare me? No, because they're not going to deploy to 100K and like mm. be up at night building the cap table for the founder. Um, but if you have a very similar cheap, fast capital proposition, then yeah, probably you're going to... You should be scared. Yeah. yeah. And would you want Tiger as an LP? No, we have not allowed, we have not sort of, not allowed, but we have not taken VCs in our, as our LP. We, we've had uh, late stage VCs in our fund um, and it's, we're only, you know, we've just deployed fund one, so it's early days, but it's been great. Yeah. Like, you know, I think you select who they are, obviously, but it's been, it's been great for the knowledge sharing. It's been great for, you know, someone's talking on the prior panel about SPVs, and yeah. we just did an SPV, and in some ways it was great because, you know, we knew the management right from the start. In other ways, it was way above my pay grade. But, you know, having a later stage fund in there who we're super friendly with really helped us look at it better. So I think it's... Yeah, yeah, absolutely. It's two sides, There's no right. right answer. In our case, There's no right answer. Because it's a proof of concept, and we're learning. We wanted to remain as flexible as possible and not commit to things that we didn't know exactly how they would pan out. So we do have people in the investment ecosystem because they're our people, but not uh, VC funds directly. Because we didn't. If I sit in front of a founder and be like, I can give you unfiltered, independent advice. We need to man manage that, uh, especially in a world where, to your point on later stage, they're getting more and more compressed. <laughs> and suddenly, like, you have serious B investors writing <laughs> SE checks. But yeah, we'll see, we'll see. We'll it's getting fancy. compressed from both ends, to be fair. But, you know, there was a panel uh, right at the beginning of the day and talking about the angels that are coming in, and particularly as we've got more operators in Europe who are having exits or <laughs> taking secondaries yeah, often way earlier than they should be taking secondaries, <laughs> frankly. Um, but that's kind of pressing on the bottom, where you've got the angels being able to mm. take out a pre-seed or even a seed mm. round entirely, and then obviously these bigger players coming from the top. So, but, you know, it's, it's squeezing everything. So one of the points that Matt made was the fact these 10 plus 1 plus 1, does that structure even make sense anymore? I mean, and so one of the things about sort of innovation in VC is the traditional VC model, which has been around for decades, is it even relevant in this day and age? I mean, does it? I think it's very relevant because it is what most LPs want to buy, sell people the product they want to buy. But um, I think that, um, and this bit, by the way, everyone is very exciting. <laughs> Because I can feel the room is dying to know what the future structure of LP of, of VC funds are. People are taking, they're just taking notes on their phones, right? They're not looking at email, I can tell that. Um, I think that that is an area of innovation. As a VC, you sit there and you say, like, poor little VC, but you say, right, it's 10 years until they make any money. And, you know, that, it's all about alignment, right? Is the alignment right? And I think we're getting more and more sophistication with that, whether that's SPVs that give you deal by deal exposure, which is the positive side of that from an economic point of view whether that's rolling funds or whether that's some of the new structures that are coming out. You know, Sequoia is perhaps not what you're getting at with this question, but you know, uh, people are looking at the model and saying, I can do this differently. So we looked at it and we raised fund one. We said, should we try and do it differently? In the end, we said, well, no, because we've got too much we're trying to do differently, a bit like you can't, and like, we can't be selling a different product yeah. as well. Mm. I think for the most part, the tenure part works really well. Like in a lot of what we do, 10 years is more than enough to especially at seed, get into a company, grow that company, figure out whether or not it's working. And then especially now in the later stages, you can actually get secondaries. There's no reason to wait till, till the, the ultimate exit either if you choose not to, uh, and if that's your, your fun strategy. Uh, I think there's a couple of areas where it does really hurt, and that's particularly in stuff that's very deep tech. I think the 10-year the pressure is sometimes the, the, wrong, the wrong structure for that. Um, so I think you should just design your fund to think about like, think about what you're investing in. Does it allow you to, to have the optimal success, right? And, and I think for the most part, actually, if we look, if I look at what we do in Europe, it's not particularly that uh, risky in terms of the, the the venture stage. And so ten years is is I think more than enough. And if I were an LP, I wouldn't really want to go into a 
like in any of our funds without that 10 year pressure. Yep. Whereas there are some definitely some deep tech and biotech funds where you actually want the opposite. You want them to have more time yep. and be able to take these really, really big bets. And it's interesting actually to see the evolution of the market. There are fund is built on AngelList, talking about also outsourcing <laughs> back office and stuff, it's built on AngelList and the default template is 12 plus two. 12 plus two, yeah. is it? Hmm. Wow. In the, yes, yeah, yeah. Yeah. It's 12 plus 2. You start to look at the statistics because, uh, now. Yeah, it's most, 14 most funds, years. Yeah. yeah, most funds yeah. are not closed. I think it's 14.7, yeah. yeah, 14.8. Exactly. I had an interesting conversation with an LP, not a current LP, a potential LP, <laughs> uh, a couple of weeks ago, who was saying that, talking about sophistication of, what, of their business and saying what we like to do, what they like to do as LP is, when you get towards the end of that fund cycle, they like to come in and buy out or offer to buy out existing yeah. LPs yeah, and re-incentivize the manager with a new carry yeah, maybe, that, maybe that's right, maybe that's wrong, but it's, a, it's an interesting feature again, you know, to the market becoming more sophisticated and, and hopefully more efficient. It is nice when LPs get innovative. And <laughs> <laughs> I think the next panel is innovation in LP. In LP. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Outside the box. Thing outside the box. <laughs> uh, better for future returns, sector focus or geographic focus? I mean... Sector. Yeah. Yeah. I think especially like, we're seeing just so many distributed teams and we also like we're focused on Europe and increasingly you look at companies and you look at the location and they're like internet yeah. or the cloud and yeah. you're like okay I don't, I don't really know where you're based so I'll meet with you because I have no idea um, and the founders are actually so distributed that you, like the, the geography is starting to make less sense actually. And so follow up to that though is if you have the prevalence of sort of national focused government LPs in Europe that do push for constraints geographically, is that now just outdated? I think so. Probably. Yeah. Yeah. It looks that way, right? I, I think they're going to have an adverse selection problem. Yeah. yeah. Actually, where exactly. if they invest in funds that are geographically focused on, and then those companies that are geographically focused, they are probably going to be at a disadvantage in hiring. Mm. Those companies are at a disadvantage in hiring, and so the returns from that fund will, will just be poor, probably. Having a board seat important or overrated? Overrated. overrated. And how many boards is too many for a VC to be on? One. <laughs> I'm, on I'm on 10. Uh, it's actually not much of a problem. Uh, so I'm on 10. I think it's actually really important. It's a but it depends I'm on, on, I guess, your, again, your strategy as a fund. So I do two to three deals per year. Yep. Uh, at any given time, I'm working very closely with four to five companies, and I'm on about eight to 10 boards. Okay. And it's been that, like that since probably about year three or four of Connect. Uh, and I think what works is it, it, it also forces you to think about your time as a GP. Uh, and time is the, like, the one resource we haven't yet figured out how to, how to scale. And so, so, so it, it, it's a great forcing function, but also we've, what we found is just from an a investment perspective, as you get into series A and B and there's a lot of pressure put on pro rata, it actually really, really helps if you're the VC that is, you know, that has the highest time commitment, that has been, you know, the most helpful and supportive, and oftentimes that expresses itself uh, in actually just meeting with the founder every single month and, and actually being, uh, you know, really supportive and, and, and trying to help as much as possible. I know it's not necessarily true, but there's plenty of VCs who end up not taking board seats, and they actually need the forcing factor. Of a, of a board seat in order to, to figure out, like, you should be meeting with this company more regularly and, and helping them. So I think it's also an advantage uh, at seed to, to have board seats. The number is N plus one, <laughs> where, where one is the one where you are not being helpful <laughs> or you are not contributing in any yeah. meaningful way. Yeah. There's too many, right? I mean, the, be the best phrase I heard <clears throat> around this kind of notion around board seat is that every board meeting should be a whiteboard meeting. And mm -hmm. if it's not, then... It's, it's, it's not meaningful. Sure. And I think to that point, it also depends how you define board, right? I think that is a big thing because MDs are absolutely like meeting them monthly, like having workshops, being the like go-to person when they're thinking. That is important for sure and there's no way that is overrated. Itself, the format of the board and then prepare, spending like two days preparing slides to report, that is what is like a bit um, overrated, so. But would you foresee, so in private equity, right, oftentimes the funds appoint board members who are not part of the team. Would you foresee a future where VCs do that more often? I think it would be an interesting innovation, yeah. action venture. Yeah. You, could, you could say, like, I'm not the right person to be helping you at this stage, but I, we could, we'll, we'll find this someone. industry or this. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, we'll find someone to bring in who's, who's probably the, the best to help you with this. Uh, and I think also... One, one of the scouts, perhaps. <laughs> but, but, but I think one of the things like founders don't realize, even sometimes you speak to VCs and they don't realize it, is there's a big difference between your role as a shareholder and your role as a board member. Yep. 
I think people don't realize that, and actually one of the things that can help is to appoint someone else to take your board seat, and then you can just act as a shareholder, especially in the later stages where you might actually want to behave differently as a shareholder than you would as on the board. Um, oh, this is relating to the HUD group, I think. Is the US the best place in general to IPO a company? It looks that way. Yes, <laughs> yes for sure. Uh, is the SPAC craze over? The what craze? SPAC. SPAC. Have you heard of them? <laughs> I used to hear it a lot. It's gone away, actually. I think it's over. Yeah, I think I'm it's guessing over. that one's over. Uh, no, it's uh, not over, but it's <laughs> definitely diminished. chilled out somewhat. But it's something that the rate is still quite higher than historical. Yeah. Um, ooh, this one's coming from LinkedIn. Is it justifiable in 2021 for a VC firm to have 15 partners and none of them is a woman? Is that even a question? No, it's not justifiable. <clears throat> that was related to a German VC. Uh, <laughs> It was, a, it was, you know, there was a big Sifted article, and that was, yeah. Um, so bravo for Sifted for getting a question out here. Um, is it more important for a VC to have a strong personal brand or for the firm to have a strong brand? So the individual or the firm going forward? Oh, I'd say the, f I think the firm, just to give you an answer, I mean. That's probably because Czech's got a much stronger brand than I have, so I like to think <laughs> that the firm is, it's really all about the firm. <laughs> I, I think it depends on whether you're creating a firm that you want to outlive the original yeah. partners or right. not. Yeah, and right. if you do, then I think you have to invest in the firm brand, otherwise there isn't really right. anything for new partners to come into. I mean, there's a, and the firm brand is just a reflection of the way you do things, and so you're really creating stuff that is, is kind of scalable and can outlive you. But there are firms out there that are like, we're, you know, we're doing this, and like, when we retire, the firm's done. I think it's just more of, you have to take a point of view. And you I think it's, it's super helpful for the founders there, right? Look at your firm. Like, you know, people actually know what Connect is, stands for. If, if they don't know Connect yet, they can go and, <laughs> they can go and it's differentiated yeah. that brand, right? Yeah. Product Focus VC, okay. You looked, that looked very, you looked very happy with it. No, I tell you why, because I, so in a previous life, I helped <laughs> companies, <laughs> funds build their brands, right. including well, Connect and a number of others. Very helpful. Um, and so from, from my perspective, I think... First of all, brand is everything you make, everything you say, everything you do, and everything you provide. So all of it is related to brand in some way. Uh, and then secondly, I would say that, you know, if, you're, if the individual has a brand, mm. then you need to harness that to the firm, right? Yeah. Like, these things work in tandem. Of course, every individual should have... And again, I don't mean this in a get on TikTok and do your influencer, <laughs> influencer thing, but it's like... What does Matt stand for? What does Carmen stand for? What does Sitar stand for? Mm -hmm. In relation to this firm, and what does that stand for? So I, I don't think you can separate them out, and I don't think you say one is more important than the other. These are like, you know, a kind of a set of elements that you pull together and then make sure that the world fully understands what it is you represent. But you want to talk about, like, some innovation opportunities in VC, right, which we're supposed to be talking about. That is a massive one, right? How many VC firms look the same? You know, how many VC firms really stand out and say to founders, this is what you get if you want to partner with us? I think that's a huge opportunity for the industry. And also, as, you know, younger people coming into starting companies and, and wanting to grow, these things are really important to them. You know, before it was just about capital. Yeah, but I would say, this, again, this is where I make the distinction. Some of the things you're talking about are related to what does the website look like? What's the headline? What's the messaging? What's the kind of, like, one-liner? And I would actually say, that, that's all fine, you can, but that can be a lipstick on a pig situation. Yeah, it mostly right? is, right? Right, and, 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 you know, relatively new to this on the fun side of it and being a VC, and actually I've just left the brand stuff alone for now, and I've gone out and done the work. We can tell. And, huh? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 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 you noticed, right. <laughs> but, 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 you know, I, I, and again, I, I say that has got, it's going to have more of an impact, whether they're young founders, yeah. whether they're LPs, whoever they are in the system, in the ecosystem, to understand what it is we're doing. When they go, oh, you did those things. Oh, and you did it this way. Yeah, we, we and actually... that is the most important part of your brand, irrespective of how cool your logo yeah, is. Yeah, I agree, but I just think there's, there's opportunity. Like, we've done a, like, and, and we're all embarrassed about our websites and our content, probably, right? We, sh we probably should be as an industry. But we've had founders approach us and make videos for us and write our investment memos for us and say, I've, Ada exists, wow, I'm just, I've never seen a VC like this. And these are particular kind of founders, what have you. But like, that is a huge opportunity for VCs to open up the, to, to get better at sourcing, right? To say, I'm going to 
make a brand that speaks to founders in a different way, rather than just like, I'm so-and-so capital and I've got lots of experience on yeah, like this. But, but Matt, you're saying, like, you started the fund with a point of view and standing for something to begin with, and there are a lot of venture funds exactly. that just don't, right? And yeah, so yeah. for the first three years, Connect's website was terrible, logo was terrible. Like, you would say, like, what people consider brand was terrible, but what we focused on was what we stood for and what we want to invest in, and, and that was it. And then, thank God, we worked with Gabby, and he actually made it all, like, look really good and help us articulate it all and actually say it in a, in a much better way. Yeah. But we had this conversation when you worked with us, there's a whole bunch of clients you've had where it was really hard for you because in the end, they didn't actually stand for anything. Mm -hmm. So it's like, how do you make a brand when the firm doesn't have right. a point of view or a position or stand for anything? It's really hard. And I think in Europe, that's actually one of the big opportunities for a lot of funds, especially the older funds, as they, as they think about like how to compete in a hyper-competitive market. If you don't have a brand, uh, I think it's very, very hard to win, And but the brand is just a reflection of what you stand for. And I think one of the problems is a lot of these firms have huge partnerships, and they haven't really ever had the conversation, and they don't have alignment on what it is that they, they stand for. And so it is an opportunity, but it's also, I think, quite a difficult problem for some of the, the, the older firms to, to but deal But you with. have to do that. Well, that is, that's a hard process to go through. And again, if there's some level of alignment at the beginning, that's great, but I've been through a process uh, with the fund where the process was so intense that some partners were like, oh, I don't belong at this fund, and went, <laughs> went somewhere else and started something new and did something different because they recognized going for it. So you've got to be prepared for the fallout. But this is what I'm saying. If, you, if you're really clear about what it is, whether your website's good, bad, or otherwise, whether you are like got cool content or otherwise, unless you have that sense of purpose and mission and vision mm. really baked into what it is you're attempting to do, then you, know, you might as well give up and go home anyway because it's, it's going to get messy. Have you seen LPs doing this well? I mean, LP? LPs are a new audience for me. <laughs> I'm here to learn <laughs> uh, and to engage with them and understand what it is they're thinking about. Um, I've seen LPs. Uh, yeah, Step High Adventure. <laughs> yeah. 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 No, yeah, I'm true. seeing LPs yeah. asking more and more about that. Like, mm. actually, I've referred multiple to a couple of LPs because yeah. they want to also, like, likewise, it's not the problem I see, and I've been in a couple of um, these processes, is like, it's so hard to differentiate but because they. There's nothing to differentiate, right? <laughs> and, and that is a problem. And uh, so it's not just only how you tell your story, but there needs to be something to tell. And, and the, a lot of the market is very, very similar. But, but I mean, to be fair, like for LPs, like they don't need to be that competitive. No. Right? Like it's still yeah, a market yeah, that LPs they run. Exactly. So they don't really need to. And the, like everything we're saying about VC, it's because like we're all starting new funds, or I'm probably the oldest one now, but like it's a competitive market. If you're just like a really established, really successful firm, it probably doesn't matter because mm -hmm. your brand is just the successful portfolio you have there is just this entire like middle tier mm. yeah. venture mm. that is undifferentiated and is really struggling right now because it came from a market where it wasn't very competitive and it's hyper competitive now and we've started in markets that are competitive so we go in with this mindset of like what's my positioning how do I win mm -hmm. And I think there's just a, a, a huge number of firms that don't have to do that. And then there's like a very small number of firms that are just really successful and honestly doesn't really matter yeah. mm -hmm. like what it is. Like they stand for just picking really well and being very successful and that's okay. <laughs> so. And that's their mojo. But I think that's yeah. one, of the, they're one of the things. I think a lot of LPs are just, they don't really care. Yeah, but LPs don't have to. <laughs> they no, really don't. They can I mean, pick whatever have to be, VCs have to be visible. LPs But I think don't. even with LPs, you're seeing, like, it's just because in the past like month, I got two LPs asking us for our, like, the agency that helped us with the brand. I was like, yeah, these, no agency. Not to be, but were these, were these institutional investors? Were they family yeah, they were offices? Institutional were they investors, but getting into a market which maybe is now more competitive, they're getting more competitive, which is the micro fund one, which is, there's not, like, the, the problem, I guess, LPs, never had FOMO because they knew they would get it. Like if you raise 400 million fund then they, and you had like, a, you were a good LP, you were gonna get in. And if you raise 10 million, fund, 10 million or 15, they're in or out a lot of times. So they're, in that space, there is innovation in how they position themselves and, and they're starting to think about the message and how they differentiate and they're probably running a lot of the issues that uh, we as VCs run into, but I am seeing that. So I think we're about out of time. So what do you see VC looking like 10 years from now? Last question. I think we're out of time. All okay, right, I'll quickly go. It's given that we are a vertical fund, more vertical, <laughs> um, um, more accessible, more diverse, uh, more automated, more rapid, and more liquid. Wow. 
Gabby said before this, like, listen to the previous panel and say the really clever stuff that they, basically what Gabby just said. <laughs> that's good, that's good technique, yeah. yeah, I like it. Yeah. Good end point. <laughs> so we probably don't know how the market's gonna look 10 years from now, no, exactly. and at the speed at which it's moving, no, no even like imagination probably doesn't get us there, so what we at least are trying to do is make sure that we have a very flexible structure so that we can adapt to whatever the market sort of looks like. Uh, on top of everything that Gabi just said. <laughs> I think in 10 years we probably won't be talking about European venture capital. Mm -hmm. We'll just, yeah. it'll just, it'll just be super flat. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And like anyone who's still thinking about building a European venture capital firm, like in 10 years, I think you're ha ha probably a hard problem. Yeah. I agree. That's it. Good. Thank you guys very much. Thank you. Thank you. Good panel. Good panel.